Hello, I'm Ryan Rafels. So this is a video that I've been working on for a long time. And I know some of you subscribed to me specifically for this video. So um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but hopefully it's been worth the wait. I've been working on this for several months and I've never really done anything uh, this big before. And, you know, life. So, um... <laughs> So I wanted to talk about a movie that came out in 2017 called The Florida Project. I saw that there really aren't a whole ton of videos out there about it, or there's some that are either like specifically about the movie or some that are specifically about the locations, which I'll get into those later. But I am fairly local to the area, so it's something that I'm kind of passionate about, and it touches on a lot of issues that are not only seen in the central Florida area, but also on the East Coast where I'm at. A lot of these are kind of difficult subjects, just so you know, um, but the movie is well worth a watch and it really shows kind of the reality of the area that a lot of people don't see or don't talk about. And uh, it shows a lot of cool spots as well that I've seen or been to or driven past and stuff like that. So obviously there's going to be some film spoilers in here and it's going to touch on a lot of sensitive subjects. <laughs> This movie can be pretty heavy and sometimes uncomfortable, so if any of these things you're really not down with or not comfortable hearing about, then this might not be for you. Um, however, I do think a lot of these things do really need to be discussed and talked about because it's kind of the side of, of Florida and really what's surrounding a lot of these really touristy areas that really you go through, um, but nobody really talks about or acknowledges. That also affects many other parts of Florida as well, like I said, so I think it's well worth talking about and it's an issue that really needs some, uh, some light shed onto it. So first of all, let's get into some background information. So the Florida Project was the name that Walt Disney used for what would eventually become Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. The way that this name is used for the film really alludes to kind of, um, like the Disney experience um, that a lot of kids that are living immediately outside the so-called Disney bubble don't sometimes ever get to experience, which is really sad and tragic in a way. So the film focuses on a town, town called Kissimmee, Florida, which is immediately outside of Orlando. Um, the main part of it runs along Highway 192, which is just southeast of Walt Disney World Resort. The film follows a girl named Mooney who lives with her mom at a motel named the Magic Castle on Highway 192, which is an actual motel, which I'll talk about more, a lot more. It's really the main focus of the video. But as you may have noticed from the name Magic Castle, many of these places that are along 192, whether they're motels, gift shops, etc., etc., are themed to kind of be similar to Walt Disney World to draw on the influx of tourists that are passing through that area. But a lot of the time, these places are, especially in comparison, very low budget. They're often very run down. Um, and sometimes they can just come across as really cheap or really just creepy in a way. And a lot of them probably weren't always that way. It's just kind of happening with age. And that isn't to say either that there aren't some hidden gems in there also, which I'll talk about in a moment. And although I don't really know how it came about, there is a Seven Dwarfs Lane intersection at 192. And I kind of tried to look into what that was about. Couldn't really find anything. It was probably just named because of its surroundings, if I had to guess. Um, but I pass it all the time, and it's featured heavily in the movie as well. So further playing kind of into this analogy, the people that have worked on the movie have said that the Magic Castle is kind of an analogy for the Magic Kingdom. And this is where Mooney and her friend Scooty live. And then the neighboring motel Futureland, which is where her friends Dickie and Jancy live, is representative of Epcot in the world of the children, so to speak. And again, this makes a lot of sense with what I was talking about with the theming, wherefore these children that are living right outside, it's kind of like this is their Disney in a way. 
It's kind of like this is their Magic Kingdom and this is their Epcot because through their eyes that is their reality in a way. So from what I could find about the Magic Castle itself, it was built in 1990 on two and a quarter acres. It's located at 5055 West Earl of Bronson Memorial Highway, which is the name of 192 that runs through Kissimmee. It is three stories tall and for most of its life it was painted bright purple. According to the Osceola County property appraiser, the original developer appears to be a Miami man by the name of Simon Lowey, and the company listed was Brightway Builders, and it was then shortly after sold to a company called Park Plantation in the same year that it was built. So I'm not certain if this was the original name of the motel upon opening or not, but the owner's primary address is the same as the address of the motel. It was sold again in 2005 to a Sweet Rose Corporation and remained with them up until a couple of years ago. That's really all I was able to find regarding its origins. I was able to find the original developer's daughter through an article that she wrote about her father, which I'll link below. Um, but I reached out to her to see if she knew anything about the motel's early days and I didn't get a response. I also found the name Joseph Jabaley listed on the deed for Park Plantation Inn, and I found that he's currently a real estate attorney. It looks like he didn't finish his education until 1995, so I don't know if he was more closely involved with the motel at this time, or if it was just in an attorney uh, you know, relationship. I wasn't able to get confirmation either way. I did reach out to him as well, and I also did not hear back. Um, but I made a post about the Magic Castle on a Historic Orlando Facebook group. The information that I got back there was pretty scarce as well, but most people seem to always remember it being painted bright purple and always being called the Magic Castle. And if anyone has any further information of that, about its original name or any other paint colors, anything, any dull information like that, I would love to hear it and potentially do another video on it if I can get anything else good about it. All right, and with that, let's talk about Highway 192. So Highway 192 runs from Central Florida, just west of Walt Disney World, all the way to the East Coast and runs straight into the ocean, all the way from Kissimmee to Melbourne to Indy Atlantic, which is very close to where I am. It's a pretty normal road where I'm at, um, it's four lane in the Melbourne area, and it's got restaurants, normal everyday stores, the Melbourne Square Mall. Um, west of I-95, it's actually pretty empty for most of the drive, which is quite rare in the state of things in Florida right now, and probably uh, subject to change, but uh, knock on wood, maybe it won't. <laughs> Heading west along 192 from Melbourne, one of the first landmarks you'll see is the Reptile World Serpentarium. I have never stopped here, although one day I shall, but it's notable because it's the only thing that you see for miles, which is bizarre in a way. And what is a Serpentarium? I don't know if it's like a zoo type thing or if it's a store. I have no idea. So then immediately after this, you hit St. Cloud. Around St. Cloud, things start to get a little more dense, but nothing too crazy. There's some home developments out there, a school, a couple gas stations kind of thing. And then just a little bit further and you arrive in Kissimmee. And this is where things get wild. At the time of writing this script, there were only four rent listings under $1,000 a month in Kissimmee. And these are studios, one bedrooms, ranging from anywhere from 400 to 2,000 square feet, with the highest rents being just shy of $12,000 a month. And I did not make a mistake there, $12,000. Although these are usually fairly large vacation themed homes, uh, for the wealthy. The next tier of normal homes below that range from $4,500 to just under $9,000 a month. For what most would consider like a normal average family home, you're looking at $1,500 at the absolute lowest, but it goes all the way up to $4,000. And honestly, even though I only did this research a couple months ago, it's probably gone up already. So at the time of writing, I could only find one home that fit 
that criteria at $1,500 and every other one was above 17. I'm sure that $1,500 home is long gone now. <laughs> the traffic on 192 is pretty substantial as you could probably imagine. It is a six lane road in this area with businesses completely covering both sides. As is addressed in the movie, there are several lower budget motels along 192, most of which are the kinds that most would probably not even consider. And homelessness is another big factor in the area with a lot of people that do roam the streets. And as is the folks of the movie, many people living in these motels. Not everything on this road is like that though. There is a wide range and there are many larger resort style hotels and then just your normal average hotels like your you know your Wyndham's your best westerns one of them includes this one which I stay at quite often which has some Disney view rooms that I like to splurge on sometimes see the fireworks from your room it's pretty cool there are other attractions in the area like Old Town which is a big one that has lots of shopping and even some rides at a fun spot location there's several mini golf courses which I'm uh, pretty big on like this one which I've actually never golfed at <laughs> but it does have a built-in CC's, which is pretty unique, and I've eaten there several occasions. There's also places like Machine Gun America, where you can fire machine guns in an indoor range, because this is America, I guess. Along with many outlet malls, so many restaurants, parks like nature preserves, go-kart places, and the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. And with that, let us get into the movie, and after I'll talk about some of the places actually used in the film so we can kind of circle back. I am probably going to butcher some of these names, so first of all, I'm so sorry. So the movie was directed by Sean Baker. It stars the wonderful Willem Dafoe, who I just fell in love with after, after this movie of all movies. Uh, Bria Vinate, Brooklyn Prince. Mila Murder, Christopher Rivera, Josie Olivo, and Valeria Cotto, among others. Willem Dafoe's performance as Bobby, the hotel manager, was so good. His character was so incredibly likable, and he was actually nominated for several awards, including Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. The movie is shot from a child's perspective, meaning many of the shots are very low to the ground. Many of the more serious, like adult conversations that are had in the film are kind of muffled and kind of muted, as if you are the child who is kind of in these surroundings, preoccupied by other things, not quite sure exactly what you're hearing. So here's where the spoilers of the movie really are. So if you want to skip that, I'll put a timestamp here to where you can go to to get past all that. But be aware, even if you skip it, there may be a little spoiler or two. <laughs> so I'm just going to go through kind of some of the main points and some of the notes that I took while I was rewatching the film, and uh, we'll go from there. So the movie opens with our main character Mooney and her friend Scooty sitting under the stairwell at the Magic Castle, and we then meet their friend from Futureland Motel. The song Celebration plays as the opening credits roll against the motel's iconic purple wall, really kind of showing the juxtaposition here between the energy of the kids and their imaginations and their seemingly bleak surroundings. We then get a glimpse at some of the ways that these kids like to have fun when we see them on the second floor balcony of Future Land spitting on a car in the parking lot below. <laughs> We're then shown Mooney's mom Haley smoking weed in their motel room. This part, aside from the weed, was when I really noticed that I was kind of being taken back to some of the time that I spent in the area as a child and just kind of like the vibes of the motel room were kind of giving me that kind of like nostalgic kind of inner feeling sort of thing. You know what I'm talking about, right? And a lot of people that are local to this area and made kind of similar trips to those that I did probably kind of know what I'm talking about here. We then meet Jancy who lives with her grandma at Futureland. It turns out that the car the kids were spitting on belonged to Jancy's grandma. So we overhear in conversation that Jancy's mom had her at only 15, and despite the spitting incident, Haley and Jancy's grandma become friends. We're introduced to Scooty's mom, Ashley, who is best friends with Haley. She works at a diner and she often gives the kids food from the back door. The kids also spend a lot of time watching helicopters that take off from next door. And in real life, the Magic Castle is right next door to a business that gives helicopter tours of the area, so they incorporated this into the movie. And I would imagine, probably if you're staying there, that would probably get kind of annoying to guess. 
So this is where we start to see more of the surrounding 192 area. The kids are shown walking by Orange World, which is a large orange, a literal orange, that sells citrus fruits, juices, many other Florida-related <laughs> accessories. And we're shown one of the two wizard gift shops. And finally, they go to the Twisty Treat ice cream stand where they beg a woman for money so they can get ice cream. I almost wanted to use the word pressured the woman to give them money, but I kind of felt like I couldn't really put that on the kids because they're really just exhibiting learned behaviors. So the kids walk the halls of the motel while talking about some of the other residents and we hear them saying things like, this person has a disease that makes his feet large and this lady gets arrested a lot, and this person thinks that they're married to Jesus. So we kind of get a glimpse here into some of the some of the situations that some of the residents are facing, like health problems, mental illness problems, problems with the law. Later on, Bobby the hotel manager comes to the room and tells Haley that the kids have put a dead fish in the pool and threw water balloons at tourists. <laughs> he says to Haley in a quite spirited manner, you can't tourists. So this kind of shows you how vital tourism is to this area and to all of Florida in general, especially in the Orlando Walt Disney World area. And also shows again that the kids are often kind of running amok doing things that they should not be doing. Haley adds to Mooney in this moment in a very sarcastic tone, did you hear that? I failed as a mother, Mooney. You disgraced me. To which Mooney playfully responds, yeah, you're a disgrace, mom. So one night some tourists arrive at the motel in a taxi while Mooney and Scooty are hanging outside of the lobby. They're a newly married couple and the man had his assistant book his honeymoon trip, which is supposed to be to Walt Disney World. Obviously some sort of mistake has been made here as the couple arrives instead at the Magic Castle. <laughs> Clearly they're both very upset, the man is angry, and obviously the motel staff can't do anything about this, and the woman is understandably very distraught. While seeing this scene play out, Mooney makes a comment to Scooty that she can quote, always tell when adults are about to cry, kind of giving us more insight into the things that she's witnessed and already endured at such a young age, without exactly telling us. The next day a church van comes to deliver bread and some other supplies to the motel residents. They park in the front parking lot outside the lobby and are asked by hotel management to move to the back as it is unsightly for the tourists. Again, kind of showing where the priorities are lying here and that they would rather cover up the fact that there are people struggling in this area because we don't want the tourists to see that and get them, you know, driven away. You know, God forbid they see the struggles of the people that live here. Later on, kind of adding to the list of priorities, uh, Bobby's son comes by to help him get rid of a bed bug infested mattress in one of the rooms. He asks his dad about the new purple paint job on the motel where it's revealed that the owner spent $20,000 on it. Which of course prompts the son to ask if they can spend that on the paint job, why can they not afford an exterminator? So later we get a glimpse into one of the ways that Haley is making her money. We're shown her at a store bulk buying perfume which she then takes along with Mooney to an expensive resort and sells to people in the parking lot at an upcharged rate. As a native Floridian, I can confirm to you that things like this do happen rather frequently. <laughs> and it's really not super uncommon to see something like this going down. So at this point, the boy from Future Land is moving to New Orleans. I don't believe it was really explained why, but they packed their tiny... Honda Civic to the point where you can hardly see out of the car and as a result they don't have room for the boy to take his box of toys with him. So the dad makes him give it away to the other kids at Future Land and tells them that he'll buy him more toys when they get to New Orleans. So so far we've seen several scenarios where the conditions that these kids are in are far from ideal and seen several clues that the things happening in these kids lives are going to affect them in the long term. This kind of makes us start to think how Haley got to where she is in life now and how these kids will grow up as a result of that. Which brings into the picture many of the systemic issues that they're facing that lead to things like generational poverty and trauma, so on and so forth. Later on, as the kids watch from one of the stairways, an elder resident of the motel Gloria is sitting out by the pool, sunbathing, topless. The kids are watching this and they're snickering and making comments and Bobby has to go talk to her and force her to cover up, which he has apparently had to do on several occasions. 
even though she's been told several times that she needs to stop, and even more disgustingly knowing that there are children. In a similar vein, at some point Scooty also discovered a lighter with a naked woman on it that he hangs on to. Haley, at one point, is encouraging the kids to dance inappropriately. Later that evening, Haley and Ashley will leave their children unattended and asleep in the motel rooms while the two of them go and hang out by the pool. The next day, while the kids are hanging around the picnic tables outside unattended, a strange looking old man wanders over towards the children. Bobby sees this, he walks over, confronts the man, sternly asking him if he can help him, to which he responds that he's looking for a soda machine and making excuses as to why he's in the area. So Bobby walks the man over to their vending machine and the man is hesitant to walk with him. The man dispenses a soda, Bobby makes him take a sip of it, and then he smacks it out of his hand onto the ground and tells him to get the out of there. On the way out towards the entrance, Bobby wrestles with the man, gets his wallet from him, gets his name, and tells him he's going to give it to the sheriff's office. And then next we have what kind of struck me as the main climax of the story. Mooney and Scooty bring Jancy to abandoned townhomes, which are, in the movie, a few properties down from the Magic Castle. They begin to severely vandalize the home, smashing windows, walls, and even toilets by pushing them out of the windows on the second floor. <laughs> Eventually, they shove a pillowcase into the home's fireplace, and Scooty lights it with his nudie lighter. This causes the home to catch fire, and all of them swear not to tell anybody what happened. So when they return back to the magic castle, Haley says to Mooney, Mooney, the old condos are on fire, don't you want to check them out? <laughs> Ashley does the same with Scooty, and begins to get suspicious when Scooty is acting really uninterested and kind of dodging the question. The whole neighborhood gathers around to watch, and even encourages the fire department to let them burn, as apparently they'd been sitting abandoned for a very long time. Come to find out, also true in real life. Haley comments, isn't this great, Mooney? It's so much better than TV. And Gloria says to Bobby, they were so ugly, I was thinking of burning them down. We later see that the neighborhood gets a good amount of entertainment of this variety when a fight breaks out in the parking lot of the Magic Castle. Somebody full-on gets hit with a car, not run over, but hit nonetheless, and the whole building is out on the balconies cheering and, you know, whooping them on, whatever with the kids, of course. So following all of this, Mooney goes to Ashley's restaurant to get food as she usually does. And at this point, Ashley tells Mooney that she can't see Scooty anymore, which obviously she does not understand. When Haley hears about this, she takes Mooney and goes down to the restaurant to confront Ashley. Long story short, orders a bunch of food, causes a huge scene. And this scene in particular really got me thinking, because while I was watching it, really all that I could think was that first of all, Mooney is not going to understand why she's losing her best friend and her mom taking her to see Ashley and causing a disturbance like that is only going to cause her more confusion and really have an effect on her as she gets older. When a child sees a parent act in a manner like this, obviously at the time the child is not fully aware of what's going on or understanding what's happening, but as Mooney is getting older she's going to start to piece things together and she'll start to either handle situations in the same manner as her mother, or she'll just begin to wonder why her mother responded that way, and it'll likely add to any resentment that she's going to feel towards her in the future. That is, at least until she understands her mother's upbringing and why she acts the way that she does, if she ever has that realization and is able to forgive her. At the very least, what we can take away from this is just to be careful how you act or what you do or you say, around children, or really anybody, but children especially, because you never know what they'll pick up on, or what little thing can end up having a big impact on them. Obviously nobody is perfect, and we're all going to make mistakes, because we're humans, um, but I'm sure right now, just as an example, you can think of things that people said to you when you were a child, or things that you overheard or experienced, that the person in question probably doesn't even remember or didn't think was a big deal, but to you it was, and it still is. Anyhow, moving on from that, after this episode in the restaurant, Haley makes Ashley pack up the leftovers. She had let Mooney order anything that she wanted, so there was a substantial amount of food at this point. And on the way home, Haley further lets her anger overcome her, and she throws the leftovers on the ground in the parking lot of the wizard gift shop, because where else? 
Mooney obviously questions why she does this, which is the first sign of my previous point where Mooney will end up very confused about this whole situation. So Haley once again goes to sell perfume at the resort, and she and Mooney get stopped by security this time around. The security guard tells Haley that she's called the cops, and Haley remarks that she can't get arrested again, revealing a bit more about her past. And later on, Haley reveals more to us about their financial situation when Mooney asks where her iPad went, and Haley reveals to her that she had to sell it because the room costs money. And the way she explains this to Mooney is just like pepperoni on the pizza that we order. <laughs> So, the practice here to prevent people living at the motel from establishing residency is that the owners make the tenants stay at another hotel for one night a month so that they cannot establish residency, which obviously would give them rights to stay there and open a whole can of worms. So Bobby, the hotel manager, allows them to put their stuff in a spare room and then he takes pictures of the empty room per new hotel policy to prove that it was empty. Haley and Mooney go across the street to the Arabian. The motels had a deal worked out where they would charge a discounted rate for people living at the other motels to help each other out in a way. However, when they arrive, they discover that the Arabian has new owners and will not honor this discount any longer. Bobby is called over, but the new owners will not budge on the policy. He even offers to cover the difference, which was only $10, but the owner still will not allow them to stay because Haley has an outburst in the lobby and pours her soda out onto their floor. She also allows Mooney to make some very disrespectful comments towards the new owners, and the owner comments to her, no wonder you're in this situation after witnessing the outburst. And so they end up staying with Jancy's grandma at Futureland for the night. And again here there was another scene where I kind of took notice of the atmosphere, the dimly lit hotel room with only one light on, and there's just something about the environment that was kind of a callback, familiar, a little creepy yet oddly comforting, just really kind of liminal. So later on we have Jancy's birthday. So Haley gets some cupcakes and she takes Mooney and Jancy and they go hitchhiking. <laughs> And they end up at an empty field at a resort that is just outside Walt Disney World where they watch the fireworks while they have the cupcakes. Hitchhiking aside, this was actually a very sweet moment where we can really see how Haley cares and she shows that she cares and we have this, this sweet moment of connection between her and Mooney and Jancy as well. Bobby is beginning to get suspicious about how Haley is making the rent, so he asks Ashley if she's been spotting her. We're shown Haley on the phone asking what kind of car are you driving and giving somebody their Magic Castle room number. So connecting the dots, the implication here is that Haley is prostituting. After this wraps up, the man goes to use the bathroom and he is shocked to discover Mooney in the bathtub. Haley yells at him, telling him that she told him the bathroom was off limits. The next day, Haley and Mooney are seen selling magic bands outside a ticket sale building. So for those of you who don't know, magic bands are basically like bracelets from Walt Disney World that act as your park ticket. So after this, the man from the earlier incident comes back to Haley's room very angry to the point where Bobby has to get involved. And it's revealed that the man is really a piece of sh** because he was there with his family on vacation in the area when he decided to seek out these services. So while he was there that evening, Haley lifted the magic bands from his bag. Bobby basically just tells the guy that he can leave or he's going to call the police and tell them what his business was at the property. Mooney then chimes in asking if the man has to pee again, reminding us that as if this whole situation was not bad enough, there is a child involved. So Bobby, understandably fed up, tells Haley that any more guests that she has have to check in at the front desk with ID and all. Haley decides to go try to visit Ashley, and she starts off by saying, I don't know what Mooney did, but they're kids, it shouldn't affect us. And then she proceeds to ask Ashley if she can spot her on rent. Ashley confronts Haley about the prostitution, and this sends Haley into a rage, and she begins to physically beat Ashley. She then runs back to her room and pretty much has a full mental breakdown, and in the following days, DCF shows up at Haley's motel room. Moody and Jancy had spotted them from the pool, they ran up to see what was going on, Bobby stops them, tries to keep Mooney preoccupied, and he sends Jancy home. DCF tries to sit Mooney down and ask her some questions, but she's not speaking with them. And so at this point, Haley is kind of making some last-ditch efforts to kind of clean up her act a bit. 
And we have another nice scene where we see her playing with Mooney in the rain and having just kind of a pure moment of fun and love and connection with each other. They end up going back to the expensive resort where they were selling the perfume and Haley goes inside to take advantage of the free continental breakfast. Mooney is just having an absolute ball with this and is completely blown away at the experience. The hotel staff get suspicious for a moment and ask for the room number. Haley just gives them the magic castle number and they leave them alone. Mooney just had an absolute ball. However, when they get back, they find DCF and the police waiting for them at the motel room. They had collected evidence of Haley's prostitution ads and they bring Mooney to say goodbye to Scooty. And we see Ashley's badly beaten face when she opens the door. It's revealed that Mooney is to live with a family in Polk County during the investigation. Mooney is obviously very upset and begins protesting, saying to the DCF agents, do you want me to get really angry and I'm not your sweetie? Mooney and Haley are both shown throwing fits, switching back and forth in conjunction. Um, kind of really showing in an artistic way what I was talking about with the generational trauma and the repeating of patterns down the bloodline. And Mooney runs. She's able to escape the DCF agents and the police, and she runs over to Futureland. She knocks on Jancy's door, and she breaks down, saying she doesn't think she's going to see her again. Jancy is confused at first, but takes her hand, and they are shown running until they arrive at the actual Magic Kingdom, which is how the movie ends. Alright, and so for the last part of the video here, I'm going to list out some of the prominent filming locations. And I did want to add here that there are some really good videos about this specifically already by World of Micah and Adam the Woo, which I'll put in the uh, description as well. And they also have some very great videos about the area just in general, which I think are well worth checking out and I really enjoy. So Futureland is actually called the Paradise Inn, and while it is nearby to the Magic Castle, it's not right next door. It's actually about a 10 minute drive east along 192. And it is still operating today as the Paradise Inn, and it has some very mixed reviews. <laughs> some of which do talk about the people that live there, just like in the movie. The Mermaid Gift Shop, shown in the film, although not super prominent, I think they only show it once. I wanted to throw it in there because this is one that I have been to and I have actually been inside of. It's right in front of the hotel that I mentioned I've stayed at before. There's also an IHOP right next door that I've eaten in several times, so pretty cool. And also this Winnie the Pooh Squishmallow that I love so much came from there, so that's really cool. I think. <laughs> so the field where they went to watch the fireworks on Jancy's birthday was shot at the Windermere K Apartments which is right outside of the Magic Kingdom, but it is on the north end, so the opposite of where the film took place. The Arabian, where they try to stay for that one night, is actually called the Sun Inn in Suites, and it is actually located right across the street from the Magic Castle. The giant wizard head shown is for some reason known as Jungle Falls Gift Shop. I don't know why. Fun fact though, it is one of two wizard head gift shops in a very close proximity along 192. The other one is also known as the Magic Castle. It actually looks creepier than the one shown in the movie. They do look slightly different. The same owners own both of these wizard head gift shops and they are also the owners of the aforementioned mermaid gift shop as well as Studio West and Studio East, which both have United States of America themes. Orange World, as I mentioned earlier, it's also two seconds away, just west of the Magic Castle. They actually did suffer from a fire fairly recently, and the inside has been closed. However, they've continued selling things outside for the time being, and World of Micah and Adam the Woo that I mentioned earlier have had video updates on this as well, so you can keep an eye on them for Orange World news. Uh, the place that Haley and Mooney sell the Magic Bands is One Stop Ticket Center, located in between the Magic Castle and Orange World. There's a billion of these all along 192. The expensive resort where they sell perfume, I believe at one point in time was called the Inn at Calypso, but it is now a Holiday Inn Express at South Lake Buena Vista. The Twisty Treat. The website that I was referring to for these filming locations actually has this one incorrect. In World of Micah's video, he had pointed out the twisty treat is actually gone. And as he pointed out, the address that you can see in the film takes you here. 
where you can just see the remnants of what was once a twisty treat. This location was also just east of the Magic Castle. So the diner that Ashley works at is actually pretty far from 192 in comparison to everything else here. It's a bit over a half hour drive. I looked that up at night. It's probably longer during the day. It's located on Colonial Drive and it is called Mr. Quick Restaurant. So I know that this has been quite a long video for me especially. So thank you if you stuck with me this far. All you that were waiting for this specifically, like... I'm so sorry it took me so long, but I hope it was well worth it, like I said. The last thing that I want to cover is what happened with the Magic Castle. So to start off, there were people actually living here. It did have very mixed reviews, similar to the Paradise Inn. The motel was owned for 17 years by David Sarfati and his wife Deborah Buxton. They had several people living in the motel at the time, several of which were working there in exchange for the rooms, actually. The owners were looking to retire and sold the hotel to a company. Many guests apparently did think very highly of the owners, but say that they were given no warning about the sale. Although Sarfati says that he was equally as shocked when the dumpsters, containers, and construction equipment suddenly showed up and the new owners wanted everyone out. Sarfati said that he thought the tenants would have had months to prepare and he never would have done that to his people. Some of the resident workers were forced to find a home and a job while others who are living there while raising kids and trying to go to college don't know where they are going to go. Unfortunately, everyone was forced to leave and the Magic Castle was turned into Developer Inn Highway. So Developer Inn is its own brand that's purchased and remodeled several rundown hotels across the state of Florida. And it seems they may have now either been bought by or partnered with a Wyndham brand I saw. So I've stayed in a hotel similar to this before. It is also on 192. It is called the Greenpoint. It was once one of these rundown motels, but it's gotten some love and TLC. And it is actually very clean and modern and nice now. And I would definitely go again. I did like how they cleaned it up a lot. And the developer inn seems to be no exception to that. It looks very nice, and it apparently even has a tribute to the film inside the lobby. Although, the only picture of it I was able to find was what appears to be this artist mock-up. At least I hope it's an artist mock-up, because there is this glaring grammatical mistake in there. I would consider staying there at some point, and actually I probably will stay there at some point. I can do another video or something probably then. Although it is quite upsetting that the people who were living here just trying to survive had to leave the way that they did. This is really a double-edged sword in this way because while it is very nice to see love and rejuvenation going into these places that seem better days and injecting new life into the area, at the same time, we do need to really do something about all of the locals who are struggling. Because it's not just in Orlando, it's in the whole state. Where I am along the East Coast, it is very bad as well. Here, where I'm at, we have very wealthy... This is really reducing it down to basics. Of course, there are going to be some outliers, but... Basically, we have a very wealthy beachside and a very not wealthy mainland home prices on the mainland are being driven up by a lot of wealthy coming in from out of the area and a lot of locals are having issues finding places to live and well-paying jobs and it's like we're kind of being priced out of our own homes in a way which is very super sad and very not okay and something really needs to be done about this because something's got to give eventually and things just can't keep going the way that they're going sustainably. And it's also a bit upsetting that kind of the kitschy 90s theming that defined so many of these areas is being removed in favor of overly sleek modernism, but I could make an entire video <laughs> on that alone. And actually, there is a video series by Poseidon Entertainment called Theme Parks Were Better in the 90s, which covers not only theme parks, but also malls and a whole broad range of things and kind of talks about how a lot of this uniqueness is being stripped away. So with that, thank you so much for watching this. Thank you for sticking with me. I hope that I help bring some light to some of these um, darker subjects that we're facing around here that really need our attention. And thank you so much also to the makers of the Florida Project for bringing light to this. It's a great watch. It's an informative watch.
it's just a very well executed project all around. So what can we do? As Floridians or even as visitors, let's just appreciate the good parts of this state that we can and for the bad parts, let's just shed light, try to be of service to others and help each other out as much as we can as a community. Try to keep our Florida livable, really, is what it comes down to. So, thanks guys. Have a great day. Thanks so much for watching. Love you. Bye. Hey